It's just after I see a movie, I like to go get a piece of pie and talk about it. It's sort of a little tradition I have. Do you like to get pie after you see a good movie? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to A Piece of Pie, the queer film podcast. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and my contributors this week are my friends, Rob and Lauren. Welcome back. Hello. Hey, Hello. thanks for having us. Thank you. It's always nice to have the both of you on. Always a great chat. 2022, despite being a rough year politically, I feel like there was a lot of, maybe not a lot, but more than usual, positive rep- representation of queer stories. Um, and these are two of the sort of gay rom-coms uh, that hit last year. One more um, controversial than the other, but we'll get into all that. Uh, so Fire Island came out first, so we always like to go in order. Um, Fire Island is a, a queer adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, um, which is, I mean, I've, so I don't know Pride and Prejudice super well. Lauren, I know you're very familiar. I do. <laughs> uh, can you give us a rundown on Fire Island and its general premise? Okay, so uh, Fire Island is uh, takes place at exactly that place, that magical gay mecca. Um, it's about a man named Noah, I want to say. That's Joel Kim Booster, um, who comes for a fun week with his best friends to stay with their sort of like queer mom played by Margaret Cho who owns a house there and then reveals she is losing the house. So it is going to be like their last time, like in that place together. Um, They end up kind of meeting and hanging out with this other group of gays who are quite wealthy, including a doctor named Will, who is snobby, socially awkward. It's hard to say at first, But, um, and then Noah's friend, Howie, played by Bowen Yang, um, falls for Will's friend. Um, and I, he, his name is escaping me. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of romantic entanglements. There's like some kind of confusion, rom-com shenanigans, and it's all taking place in the backdrop of this beautiful gay mecca, Fire Island. Um, there's a lot about class differences, um, so I will say about Pride and Prejudice, um, I I really love, I love the book. Um, the 2005 movie I think is great um, with Keira Knightley and Rosamund Pike. Um, have never seen the Colin Firth one because it's a mini series. And back in the 90s, that meant like renting like four VHS tapes. And I just wanted to make out with my boyfriend. So I did not have the time for that. Um, I remember I in really, college, I knew someone who had the whole box set, and it always seemed so daunting. Knew somebody who had the box set. It always yeah. seemed so daunting, but now in the age of streaming and the age of binging, oh, yeah. I feel like I could do it easily. Yeah, it's probably like a weekend binge. Um, yeah, but it felt so like those VHS tapes, VHS especially. Yeah. Was, You're like, yeah, I don't have time um, for this. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I will say that um, while I love Pride and Prejudice, I do not often love Pride and Prejudice adaptations because um, I feel like it gets used as a marketing tool a lot. Like, and there are like, and you all, you both know, you know, I write books that are reimaginings of classic texts. I love a good retelling. A lot of Pride and Prejudice retellings are not good. Um, Bridget Jones' Diary is pretty good. Um, It's also more, like, inspired by Pride and Prejudice than I would say, like, a straight-up, like, reimagining. But it does a good job with the Mr. Darcy character, who is Will in Fire Island. Um, And I will say I get very tired of people saying, like, first of all, straight women really overuse the term Mr. Darcy. Um... Straight women fucking love Mr. Darcy. And I kind of get it, but also it's like, it's just become just this ubiquitous term. And I'm like, can we think about who Mr. Darcy actually is? Because he's kind of shitty at first. And I will say, I think Fire Island is the best modern Pride and Prejudice adaptation I've seen or read. I have declared mostly a moratorium on Pride and Prejudice adaptations because 
a lot of them just don't get the original story and they're really important parts of the original story. Class difference is huge. The environment that the Bennets, uh, the family in the original Pride and Prejudice are in is huge. Where like, you know, again, class difference, this is a family without a ton of money. They are expecting the daughters because there are five, I think there are five daughters and you, you know, that's Noah and his friends in Fire Island. Like it's, that's done really well. Um, the daughters are all expected to like marry well, except for Elizabeth, who is the Noah character, is just kind of like, I don't know about this, you know. Um, then Elizabeth meets Mr. Darcy, who's kind of an ass to her at first. And she's like, what's your deal? And they end up becoming attracted to one another. A lot of, I found a lot of people use Pride and Prejudice as code for Opposites Attract, which I don't love because Opposites Attract is its own thing, especially in like romance novels and rom-coms, which that's a trope I love, but it's its own trope. It's not necessarily Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice is more specific. I feel like what I really loved about Fire Island is Joel Kim Booster, who wrote the movie and who stars, knows the original text very well, like has this really beautiful understanding of it. And the fact that he, not only are class differences a very big part of Fire Island, but also it is, Fire Island is like its own environment where there are kind of its own rules and its own rituals. And it is kind of this sort of, modern day very gay like courtly society and it's what i really enjoyed about the movie also like pride and prejudice is a comedy of manners like it's funny and i feel like a lot of modern day adaptations like don't get that either and like this is just there are just some very silly cute moments along with like the deeper stuff and is it a perfect movie? No, but when it comes to reimagining Pride and Prejudice, like, it is really good. I was like, he knows this. He knows this book, like, far better than a lot of people who have, who have attempted this. So there you go. That's, that's my, that's my Pride and Prejudice. And it's going to come up more as we talk, I'm sure. Oh, of course. Well, that's our time. That that's our time for today. Thanks for joining us on the <laughs> I'm flipping Rob off right now. <laughs> no, that, that, that was all super helpful to hear, um, especially as someone who uh, is also, like Brian, not familiar with Pride and Prejudice. Um, but, you know, watching Fire Island for the second time, knowing we were going to talk about it, um, it was really fun to almost like reverse engineer Pride and Prejudice in my head like if I needed to adapt Fire Island into like 18th century England, like how would I do it? What would the the yeah. equivalences be? And so, so it was it was fun um, going back that way, and um, even just things like um, like oh the the Tomas and Matt characters, like they must be like silly little girls. Um, they are, and there it's you go. delightful. Like. That just from the beginning, it was like, oh, here's Lydia and Kitty. And oh, it's like, nice. who in 2005 were Jenna Malone and Carrie Mulligan. So, um, yeah. And Carrie Is Mulligan. Is that the like, one with uh, uh, Kira Knightley? Yes. And it's Rosamund 2005. Pike. Okay. Yeah, and Rosamund Pike is um, Jane, who is the Bo and Yang character. Okay. Um, also one that, also a character that is done very well in Fire Island. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, Jane's the romantic. Jane is, like, Jane, you know, wants the guy. Um, but is also very close to Elizabeth. And, like, you know, sometimes there's some friction, which I thought, again, was done well in the movie. Um but yeah, the little sisters have a lot of like comic relief in Pride and Prejudice. One of them does run off with uh, Mr. Wickham, who is a uh, uh, Dax Dex in the movie. Um, and that's another thing I thought was updated really well for Fire Island was 
the whole thing with um, Matt Rogers' character and Dex. And I was like, I like that he did that because in the in the original text, like it is kind of scandalous because like she runs off with this guy and like, she's very young. Like she's like 15 or so. So like, you know, not horribly young for the time period, but it's still like a little, uh. so I thought it was interesting how like that was, that was reconceived. And for me, that is also a very important part of Pride and Prejudice that often in modern adaptations, just does not work for me and I was just like oh like I like the choice here I will (laughs) say also um if you've seen Bridget Jones Diary um Wickham Dex is also Hugh Grant so okay I had forgotten that uh Bridget Jones was an adaptation as well um yeah it's it's not didn't put that together it's not quite as direct like Fire Island is pretty like hits most of the beats of Pride and Prejudice, and that's also very impressive. Um, Bridget Jones' Diary, it's a little bit more loosey-goosey, but you have kind of the basic stuff where, you know, you have Mark Darcy, um, you have, shit, what is um, Hugh Grant's character's name? I don't remember. Have Hugh Grant's character like talking shit about Mark Darcy saying like this one thing happened and um, turns out it's, you know, it's not true. Um, but yeah, like, and then Bridget Jones is kind yeah, of the yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Bennett character. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that's like Bridget Jones' diary is one that I love, like the book and the movie. Um, but yeah, it's it's got Pride and Prejudice roots okay. too, um, and that's also another one that does well with the Mister Darcy character because, like, yeah, I again, like that character gets so romanticized that like people forget like at first he's an asshole (laughs) like and I thought Conrad Ricamora I mean the way he's written I thought was really good and I thought Conrad Ricamora like other than being so gorgeous just did a really good job with that Conrad Ricamora holding back a laugh is like my kink like (laughs) it's just so hot and he does it so well and so often in the movie also, um, his little ice cream cones. Like, any yes. time he had a small ice cream cone, I was like, that is the cutest and, like, dumbest little thing, and I love it. Yeah. Um, Bridget Jones' Diary was the reason I think we all had a short-lived crush on Colin Firth for a few years there in the early aughts. Um, I mean, mine's kind of still going, but... I just got tired of him, and honestly, when he won the Oscar for that terrible movie, that was like, ugh, whatever. Like, I just, I still like him. Like, he's fine. He's not someone that I'm not going to watch a movie if he's in it. But that's kind of, that was, that was when we, when we ended it. <laughs> uh, Rob, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, Fire, Fire Island, because I remember on your Letterboxd uh, review, it said uh, that it might be your favorite movie of the year. Yeah, I, I really like Fire Island a lot. And I mean, I was kind of primed to like it. I mean, Joel and Boa and, and Matt and Tomas and Margaret and Conrad. I even like, um, like I knew who Mikey Graceffa was. I knew who Nick Adams was like, this was a movie that I was very much looking forward to. Um, I, notwithstanding my Twitter feud with Joel Kim Booster about the Bernie Sanders campaign. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, remain a big fan and, I thought that uh, the the movie lived up to the very high expectations I had for it in my head. I think it's a really great example of, I think sometimes when you're looking for a mass audience, there's um, an urge to go broad, cough, cough, bros. But Fire Island is a great example of... um, you can go really specific. You can make Marissa Tomei, my cousin Vinny references. And sometimes that specificity is the way in for, for a broader audience. Um, even if it's not my inside joke, like it reminds me of my friends inside jokes. And so like, there's often like more universality in specificity. 
Um, and I think it's just such a good example. This is clearly a labor of love. This is clearly something that was, you know, inspired by by Joel's friends. And um, like, I think that the music is used so well from Carly Rae Jepsen to Britney Spears. Like, it's so cued into the movie. That dance scene with Conrad Rickamora is just adorable. Um, I'm like tearing up right now thinking about that line that that um, Noah says to um, Charlie, you know, like this week, like I was the only one um, wondering if you were good enough for him. And like, that just gets me like, I, I just, I don't know. I thought it was fantastic. Um, it probably was my favorite movie from 2022. Um, I've thought about moving it into my like top ranked on letterbox. Um, it hasn't, it hasn't been moved yet. I may need to watch it one more time. Um, but it really, it really hits the buttons for me. I will say, um, Charlie, I can never remember that actor's name, but I love him. Scully. On- Thank you. The, and I follow him on Instagram too. Um, I loved him in the second season of you and I loved that he popped mm-hmm. up here and I loved him as that character. I thought he was, he's the Bingley character in Pride and Prejudice. I thought he was so sweet, so cute. I loved when like, you know, how he passes out in the bathtub and he's all embarrassed the next morning and Charlie's like, no, like I loved sleeping on the floor. It was good for my back. And I was like, I love you. <laughs> like, that's just the sweetest thing. And I also loved Howie and I love Jane in Pride and Prejudice. So he's dating Julio Torres in real life. And like, if, if they're listening, if they ever are looking for a throuple situation, um, <laughs> I am, I am there. I will pack contact the host of job. this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and if, <laughs> I'm feeling generous. I will pass the information on to Rob. <laughs> um, no, I just think they're the most adorable couple on social media. Um, and Los Spookies is so good. Um, yeah, one of the, I love uh, that you brought up the Marissa Tomei thing. One of my, the reference that made me laugh that I made note of was, uh, what's the password? It's Cherry Jones, but all the E's are threes. <laughs> I want to yes. change my internet password to that so badly, but I'm too lazy to switch <laughs> with all of my devices. I laughed so hard at that, having been a Cherry Jones fan since yes. Cradle of Rock in 2000. When I saw, it I think birthday. that's like a bit that's this weirdly specific, like queer reference. Yes. of people in our generation, and that's yeah. why it works. And that's the the specific specificity that you were talking about. Um, it's just a great example of it, and I wanted to bring it up because it was my favorite line. I think it's my favorite line of the movie. It, it, it's a door it's incredible i um i also think and you know we may talk about this more when we get to bros but um i think it has it's such a great exploration of nuances and issues in gay relationships in gay culture and it it has some honest critiques and you know it, it discusses them really well um in a way that I didn't feel like I was in trouble and needed to go sit in the corner. Like, I didn't feel like I was like being lectured at. I I felt like it was, it was just a discussion and I, and I, um, I appreciated it for that. What were your thoughts, Brian? Oh, I thought it was, I, I mean, it's in, it was in my top 10. Um, the rewatch, I think in both, I've watched it twice now in both times, as much as um, there's so much about it that um, I do like, like I said, like the, the Cherry Jones and Marissa Tomei and um, that kind of those specific references, the thing that makes me, and then maybe this is total like film snobbery coming out and I'm sorry, but like, I can't, I'm like the acting is like real choppy at times and it takes me out that whole scene when Bo and Yang is like, tearing his heart out like it just feels like he's I don't know I feel like he I it doesn't it plays because it the movie works but I I didn't I find him I don't know I didn't like him in that scene and there's a couple of other scenes where I'm just kind of like ooh, that line reading just sounds off like um and, and there's a lot of that so there's that and then I just feel like 
I guess the the Bridget Jones diary of it all, like there's no surprises whatsoever. It's uh, it, it hits all those beats super well, um, but it's very predictable in that way. And in, well, yeah, it, it, it's based on a book that like gave yeah, us like, yeah. the a lot of cliches, yeah. like right. Cr- created I mean, that's fair. Those, yeah. those cliches that's in the fair. same way that like like you hear about like teenagers like reading Shakespeare and being like, oh well, that's really cliche. It's like, well, yeah, because he invented it. Yeah, right. And I think it's yeah, kind of the fair. same thing with Pride and, and Prejudice. Um, I think the acting in here is is great my critique is um i think there's an over reliance on voiceover that is just really oh. feels like a first time filmmaker yeah. or screenwriter issue like i just wish he trusted his voice more because i think a lot of the i think there are a couple of moments of voiceover that are really nice i think it's overused and a lot of it is just unnecessary because he conveys what he's trying to convey really well outside of it so I have a couple things to say about that. Um, number one, I absolutely agree with you. Um, it's sort of like, I know like Rob has, re- Rob read a lot of my early writing and probably I think I would over explain things when you don't need to over explain them. I was discussing Fire Island and Bros a few weeks ago when I was in New York with some of my critic friends, um, several of whom are cis queer men um and we were talking about both of the movies and the copious voiceover in fire island came up and one of my critic friends quoted a friend of his who said it's like if you show the apple logo logo and you say this is this is an apple product and we were all like whoa like and exactly I fucking hate the line, it is a truth universally acknowledged, blah, 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 because it is overused so much in everything from, like, books to movies, because at the same time, that is the voiceover I was okay with, because I was like, this is Pride and Prejudice, that is the first line. Joel, you get that one. That's that's fine. A lot of the rest of the voiceover completely agreed with you rob it's like you're showing us the apple logo you don't need to say this is apple like we get it because the rest of your storytelling is so good like do you think that's there for like street people is that there to explain to people like you know is there is there any it's just a question yeah i um i mean if i had to put money down on the side i i think um I think it's just a more general, like him not trusting his communication. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, but but that may have been like a concern of his that factored into that like larger issue. Yeah. I just, but I also feel like I feel like the people that made this didn't care if a single straight person watched it, and I kind of yeah. appreciated it for that. It's kind Same. of like this. This maybe. And Lauren used to watch Drag Race. Uh, Brian, I know you're not a fan, but it reminds like the difference between Fire Island and Bros to me is like Drag Race when it was on Logo and then Drag Race when it was on VH1 of like all of a sudden, like they are trying to think about like the straight audience and trying to cater them as well. When it was on Logo, when a lot of straight people fell in love with it still, it was, it was this is for the gays. This is for the queers. And you can enjoy it too, but we're not going to like stop to explain everything. Mm-hmm. Like you may have to Google something. You may have to like make some inferences. Um, This isn't for you, but you're welcome. Which is honestly my attitude for like gay and queer spaces too. Like that's what I want it to feel like. This isn't for you, but you are welcome. Um, I like that. Bros feels a little bit like the gay bar that has like a bachelorette party special available. <laughs> um, well, that was one of the reasons that I like, I asked because um, it does, you're right. Those two films bros of the two, and we'll get into it uh, when we get to it um, is definitely, you feel like it's catering to a straight audience. So yeah. that was the point. Like, is there, and you're right, actually, you actually answered the sort of, that was the the conversation I was trying to provoke was, whether it was who it's, it's for it from the creators. 
So I've been rewatching a lot of the original L Word, which I also listened to a full recap podcast of every episode of the original L Word and then did Gen Q. Um, and the thing about that show is that every guest they would have on the recap podcast, which was done through Autostraddle, which is a queer, like female non binary blog. Um, would be like, what was your L word origin story? And for, I I have found that my experience was a pretty common one. For a lot of us, we were, you know, people, mostly AFAB, like thinking we were straight, then watching this show and being like, why am I so interested in the lives of queer women? Hmm. Um, some of us, it took longer to figure out than others. I am pointing at myself. Um, but that, that and Fire Island to me do have some similarities in that that was also a show like that was very, very queer female oriented, not perfect, had a lot of problems, but always did give off the vibe like, and gives it off now as I rewatch like we don't give a shit if like straight men are watching like yeah there's a straight dude character here and there but no one really cares about him um or often the straight dude is like a conduit for a woman figuring out she's queer um and yeah I got the same thing from Fire Island and from I remember like logo drag race as opposed to VH1 drag race. And yeah, you're absolutely right. And yeah, I think that's why I, I really gravitated toward fire Island was like, it felt like it was by the community for the community. And it's like, yeah, it's like you said it perfectly, Rob. It's like, this isn't for you straight people, but you are welcome. Like you, you can be, you can be a guest as long as you behave yourself. <laughs> yeah. Literally one of my notes for Fire Island is it doesn't feel like it has anything to prove. Yeah. It's such a great observation Perfect. for sure. Like Perfect. it's just, it's a gay pride and prejudice. And that feels like that was what he wanted to do. And he wasn't going to sugar, yeah. uh, sugarcoat it or water it down at all. Yeah. And you're, I think that's a good, another good way of putting it. Like the, it's, it's your, it's not for you, but you are welcome. Um, yeah. Um, anything more we want to say on Fire Island or should we move over to Bros? It seems like we're heading that way anyway. I will but. say that like what I loved about Fire Island also is what I loved about the original L word is I liked that it is about romance, but the part it just had a lot of beautiful like queer friendship moments like like rob had said the specificity the inside jokes the you know being worried that this lovely doctor is not good enough for your best friend um to the point where that gets kind of damaging for you and your best friend um I just, I think there is something really lovely and magical and unique about queer friendships. And I love when queer media, which I think can sometimes just get very focused on romance or about like, or focuses on like community as a whole, both of which are great and very important. But I love seeing queer friendship moments. And for me, like a lot of what's shown for me about Fire Island was... I mean, you know, the Britney Spears scene was just sometimes was just fucking beautiful. Um, and and yeah, Marissa Tomei, Cherry Jones, like just the defense Yeager. is wrong. Oh my god, <laughs> the, def the defense is wrong. Just, just so much of that. Also, I do want a little shout out to the fact that there was talk about like body dysmorphia and body, uh, body like insecurity. And you still don't see or hear a lot about that, even though that is very much a thing. So, yeah. Yeah. I um, don't want to move on fully without bringing up Margaret Cho. Cause I don't know if we, I maybe heard, we said her name at some point, but I wanted to give props to the, the great Margaret Cho. Um, if you follow our Instagram, you know, she was the, one of the first celebrities I ever met. That's such a cute picture. <laughs> yes. I have inter I've interviewed her twice. I think Brian will attest 
if you picture what you think Margaret Cho is like, that is exactly what Margaret Cho is like. So Margaret Cho's character is kind of based on the dad, Mr. Bennett, because Mrs. Bennett, like, she's the very, like, pushy, fuss-budget mother. So there's a little of of Mrs. Bennett in her character. She is mostly, like, Mr. Bennett, like, benevolent parent figure who's a little neurotic. I read that that character was originally written as male, but I think the actor dropped out and they were just like, let's get Margaret. She's a woman now. And I thought that just worked out so beautifully. Yeah, I can't imagine. I can't imagine who else would play that role. And also just, you know, yay, queer woman representation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes queer women have a lot of queer male friends i you know i'm saying this as, <laughs> as, one of, as one of those um and just she's just wonderful i mean honestly like you can put margaret show in anything and just have her be herself and it's automatically better and just i i loved her in this when i was when i interviewed her the first time I said, you know, I I heard you just wrapped a movie with Bo and Yang. And she goes, he is my child. (laughs) Oh, that's adorable. It was so adorable. And, you know, she just, it was just, he is my child. And I was like, I love you so much, Margaret. So, yes, Margaret Cho. The, um, you know, before we move on, just a couple of random thoughts that I want to throw out there one i think that this movie is um really sex positive in a fantastic way and and i think that that's really great and maybe that'll come have a comparison uh when when we talk about bros um i think that the chemistry between joel can booster and conrad rickamore is really good that scene in the rain where they almost kiss like Oh my god! Just like hand down my pants, energy like just incredible, and um, also like I agree, Neighbors Two is actually really good and surpasses the original. <laughs> Rob, you will relate to this. People who are good friends who meet waiting tables. Oh yeah, that's that was great. I did like that a lot. Yeah, and I know like, I mean, I'm still friends with a bunch of people that as a once in future server. Um, all of that stuff really, really, I really related to, although I never spit in anyone's mimosa. I only no. ever wanted to. Yeah, to me, that is like, a, that only ends up in movies by people who like haven't waited tables. Like, right. I was going to say, like, all of my fr- I have, I never waited tables myself. Most of my friends have at some point. I, I have never heard of any of my friends ever doing that ever, like for the karma alone. Yeah. yeah, it's really, I mean, in the great big long history of the world, I'm certain it's happened, but it's not a common occurrence at all. Right. Well, with that, um, I think it's time to move on to our other movie of the evening. Um, that's going to be 2022's Bros. Uh, we've got a trailer for you and we'll see you on the other side. Hey guys, it's Bobby Lieber coming to you from the future home of the LGBTQ plus museum. Everyone is really excited and totally getting along. This happens to be Bisexual Awareness Week and no one has acknowledged it. Lesbian History Month was in March. Nobody said a goddamn thing. Of course, lesbians get a month and we get a week. So what's happening? Didn't you guys have an announcement? This is a little unexpected, but we are in a throuple situation. Yeah. You're in a throuple? Oh, Let me tell you what's progressive now. Being alone. I love my life. I love my freedom. I love my independence. That's kind of sad. That I don't want to be in a throuple? I don't even want to be in a couple. Freedom. Bobby, I had sex with that 65-year-old. Jesus, he's ripped. I know, it's like they injected steroids into Dumbledore. Oh my God, that's Aaron. He's very hot. Gay guys are so stupid. I know. But we've been smart enough to brand ourselves as being smart. It's our little secret. You met a guy? I don't think I'm his type. He's like gay Tom Brady. What are you into? One of these ripped idiots with no opinions? No, I like someone who's physically very frail and won't stop talking. And I bet he's as intimidated by you as you are by him. I'm down for whatever. Yeah, I can do whenever and I can do whatever. Cool, whatever, whenever. GIF of Michael Scott dancing. Office GIF? This person isn't gay. I 
I need you to be honest with me. You like these rowy meathead idiots. Oh, look, they're fighting. You like that? Hey. I can be tough like what your you boys. Like oh, that's what you like, huh? Oh, oh, hey, what's going on? Oh, that's cool. All right. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Now I have to go to a Pride party and you're both too old to be in the pool. Please leave. People are threatening to boycott the museum. You can't say Lincoln was gay. If we don't do this, we're letting the heterosexual terrorists win. There are trans terrorists too. Caitlyn Jenner. You are so different from me. You're very intense. I like to keep things chill. I can be chill. Just like a manly man. Sir. Up. I got you. Yeah. You're gonna need some help, oh, 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 oh. bro. Oh, oh. What is going on with you? My whole life, I prided myself on being self-reliant, but this guy has gone into my head. Maybe you're both bottoms, and that's the problem. Bottom day. Bottom day. Yeah. Gay sex was more fun when straight people were uncomfortable with it. Oh my God, do you guys remember straight people? Yeah, they had a nice run. On to 2022 bros. Like I said, uh, the it's the uh, another in a series of pretty decent queer uh, representations um, in cinema of last year. But the problem with this one is that it knows it and it wants you to know it and it wants you to give it points for it and to like it for that reason alone. Um, would you say that's a fair assessment? I was very excited for it. I will say I am a big Billy Eichner fan. Um, I have watched Difficult People a lot over the years. Um, there are some, I've found a lot of parallels to me and Rob's uh, friendship in Difficult People. Um, and, you know, I I think he's, a I think he's very funny when I heard like, you know, he's writing this big gay rom-com and it's going to start in it i'm like dude i'm on board like and i went uh, um the day it came out actually and i remember walking out and being like why did this not make all my dreams come true <laughs> as promised and i remember thinking i liked fire island better i am like just and you know just i was like i enjoyed this but i was like I don't know. And granted, I went in with super high expectations. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of, there was a lot of, I don't know if virtue signaling is quite the right phrase, but yeah, it was a lot of like wanting points for it. I will say, and you know, I'm sure we'll get into all this, but I will say that like Jim Rash uh, as a bisexual screaming about how we only get a, like, what was it we only get a day and let or no we only get a week and like lesbians get a month I was like that is pretty I'm like we bisexuals do love screaming about how like we get overlooked because it's not wrong but that did make me laugh that said oof, left a lot left a lot to be desired although I enjoyed some parts yeah that's academy award winner Jim Rash Oh, that's the right the descendants i know um I, I just love that about him i and i love him and i'm happy for him oh. he has an oscar even if i i mean that movie's fine but good it's him. just fine but yeah the best part of the descendants for me is that jim rash has an oscar so yeah <laughs> exactly uh rob what did you think yeah i also really wanted to love it i was super excited about it super stoked even when it was like starting to get a little like negative buzz before it even came out i was like defending it ready to go in um i was super disappointed the first time i watched it i i came around and uh and added a star in my review after watching it again um there are some really hilarious parts of this movie there are some really funny lines like the deborah messing stuff is hilarious to me oh my god I would watch a show about the staff of the museum any day of the week. Yes. Um, if you're going to make a movie about gays that you really want straight people to see and that you're marketing to straight people, like I'm a little turned off when you like have a lot of critiques about like hookup culture, when you like he 
there's he's in the um he goes to that party towards the beginning of the movie and he like just goes off on how stupid everyone is there like just because they're having a good time and like don't get me wrong those people exist and i think that there's an arc there to explore but like they they don't really explore it and it just goes from him being like all these people are stupid to like this is the only community that makes me feel like i have a family and it's like but you treat them like shit and a lot of it's a lot of the critiques seem to be a wink for the straight audience rather than a conversation with the queer audience and so there were just I just felt like I was being yelled at a lot and it it was hard because then there are scenes about with Bo and Yang screaming about like a monster with Reagan's like face <laughs> on it and I'm like dying laughing like there's a lot to like in this movie but there's just a lot of points that rub me the wrong way starting from the like the name of the podcast like the 11th brick like and then him like needing to explain the joke of like, well, you know, like maybe the eleventh brick was thrown by a cis straight or cis white guy. Like, like I was already exhausted after that. Like, I don't know. Can we talk know. about how awful this title is, by the way? And the even the marketing, brick? bros. Oh. I think it's a terrible title and I've thought it was a terrible title since it was announced. I was like, I, it, what would, what would you call it? Well, what I call this, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, Billy Eichner's fever dream. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Fair. Um, I would, call it, uh, I would call it hall of bisexuals. No, oh, not really. <laughs> that was another part that had me dying. And I yes. was like, I want a hall of bisexuals. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, so they, the whole, I just don't really feel like gay guys, I've never, I don't think a gay guy has ever referred to me as a bro. And I don't think I've, Rob, I don't think I've ever referred to you as a bro. Like, do, is that a if, thing? If we do, it's like, it's a joke. It's just ingenuous. Right. We do it as like a fake straight person or something. It I is was just, say, I say like bra, but like, I mean, like, yeah exactly it's it's like i mean even like buds would have been better like i don't know there's and then also the poster which is just two guys grabbing each other's asses like i just that's so to me it's like you're trying to sell us on this on this movie and for me like i said i don't like the title or the poster and i'm just kind of baffled at these choices i i feel almost like the the title and maybe even the design for the poster were like made before the movie was written. Like it just like, it, it. you're right. And it, it's not something I, I really thought about. I'm glad you brought it up. It's um, it does just kind of feed into that. Like, Hey, straight people, you're going to be okay with this. But then like, we are going to have scenes with like really graphic sex conversations that like maybe like, not everyone would want to hear that like otherwise would see a judge apatow movie and like and i'm right. fine with that like bring on the graphic yeah. scenes but like bring on the really awkward threesome i was yeah. like oh that was hilarious that so was funny. amazing except that they're all in their underwear because it's a movie the underwear <laughs> somebody's underwear would have come off by that point but i digress <laughs> the um no go ahead the like the Kristen Chenoweth, Chenoweth cameo, I think, is so great. Um, like lines like "We had AIDS and they had Glee." Like I'm like whatever ends up happening to Evan Hansen. Like yeah. when it's on point, it's on point. But then yeah. there's like that whole like story about him being asked to write a gay movie that'll appear, appear like a appease like straight audiences, and like that is just like what are you trying to accomplish with that? Like. That was something, that was a moment that I wasn't surprised to see that in the trailer, but I'm like, that actually made it into the film. Cause you know, just, 
I was like, no, that works for the trailer because it's like, oh, like because it's like making and if and if you know who Billy Eichner is too, you know like, Billy Eichner, yeah, is. Exactly. yeah, it's like but making it's just. Yeah. Yeah, then when it was in the film and it was supposed to be this big comic moment, I'm like, no, no, no. This is what you put in the trailer. Like, Ed does not make it into the movie. You know, I forget where I heard this. At some point I heard, it was in some piece of media or maybe it was a conversation in my life or who knows, maybe I dreamt it. (laughs) Um, Someone talking about how, like, if you're going to do wordplay, if you're going to do a pun, like, you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't have to wink or say like no pun intended. Like, true. You should just like 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 if the word plays good and like the people you're around are like somewhat intelligent. Like it's all gonna work out. And I think a lot of this movie felt like that wink, that like jokey no pun intended. Like, hey, mm-hmm. just so, you know, like yeah, we're doing this, but we're 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 in on it. I I think that's a really good assessment. Like I, I used to, I'm, I'm still technically a theater critic, but I used to do it a lot more frequently. And Rob was a frequent plus one of mine. And we would always like very much dislike it when a play was really winking at the audience, which an unfortunate number of plays do that. Like it was a real thing for a while. And I walked out of bros, like feeling I was being winked at a lot. And I was like, dude, you don't need to do that. <laughs> like, Especially when you have great moments, like, um, like there's that conversation where like they're switching positions for the first time. Like that's a moment that like queer people in relationships, like, like, it, that resonates like that's a big deal when you like kind of like when you switch it up there's that whole conversation about like theater school and then like straightening out like that is talk about like giving a specific and like letting your mm-hmm. audience like find the universal and the specificity that was great and and that just was my theater like school experience like i i went to an s clinic to get rid of my lisp i was like taught to lower my voice and like walk with the lower gate that hit hard and like there's so there's these incredible moments and i just i just wanted more of that movie yeah there's some real insight it does it feels like the movie keeps sort of apologizing for itself it feels like it's like the hookup scenes the one in the gym where he's like he changes his voice like i feel like i can see why that was he wanted to he wanted to present a moment when he could challenge someone about what he sounds like but it it was it didn't feel at all organic it just felt like it was building for him to give this big speech and there's a few moments like that i do like the the scene that he has at the beach uh talking about his childhood was great and then um there's a couple of other moments where yeah i definitely like i see myself in this character um but then there's others like we talked about where it's like uh it's so patronizing it's also like where fire island succeeded too was like it could do like a comedic like not gimmick but like bigger moment like broader like really well but then it would kind of just you kind of have to let your characters breathe sometimes like i say this as a writer um but it's just when the characters got to breathe in bros, like when he got to talk about theater school, which Rob, I did think of you because, <laughs> you know, I've known you a long time and I remember all of that. And like, yeah, it's just, it was a lot of, it was sometimes it just felt like gimmick after gimmick after gimmick. And yeah, it was just very much like a song and dance, like trying to appeal to straight people. It just got to be a lot. And, and like we talked about with Fire Island, like what it did really well was the specifics. And that's a big thing in writing too. I've been doing more like creative nonfiction, like personal essays lately. And that is all about specifics. Even if like favorite writing teacher, like we were even asking her once, like, what if someone doesn't get this reference? And she's like, then they don't get the reference, you know, just sometimes it's enough just to know that that's a part of the person's life. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just when when you're just trying so hard and being so broad, it shows and it just 
it doesn't work for if we're talking in like broad terms with audiences it doesn't work for the queers and it doesn't work for the straights there's there's also like a, a something that i that always bothers me when it when it happens in a romantic comedy where like there's like a disagreement or a fight between a couple and like one of them kind of owns up to being wrong and like the other one <laughs> does it but the issues are like resolved like yeah. yeah Aaron shouldn't have like told Billy to tone it down in front of his family that was wrong but Billy also shouldn't have said that Aaron hates his life in front right. of his parents. like that was a hundred percent crossing a line and I would yeah. have been really pissed about that too and I like again can you just give us like 20 seconds more of like that apology happening like yeah. that's literally all it would have taken and it's honestly i've kind of declared a moratorium on straight rom-coms like both uh i don't know rom-coms are really having a moment in the book world which in some ways i love that but in other ways like a lot of the straight ones it's like the woman acknowledging she's wrong and the dude like not acknowledging it at all I found that the queer ones are usually better about that. But no, I agree in bros, especially like by the time you're an adult, if you're meeting someone's family for the first time, there are certain things you don't say. And like, yeah, it, it 20, <laughs> it's like you said, Rob, yeah. 20 seconds of just right. hashing that out a little bit more and I would have been fine. So we talked a lot, though, about how Fire Island was Joel Kim Booster doing um Pride and Prejudice. Uh, this to me feels very much like Billy Eichner doing Nora Ephron, right down mm. to. And um, Lauren, I know you. I know you spotted that reference when they're carrying the Christmas tree from when Harry. Yes, um, of course. And it leans into that stuff. Um, but unlike with what Joel did with um, Pride and Prejudice, um, it feels like Billy Eichner doing Nora Ephron like he leans into a lot of those cliches like we were just talking about although nor even nor efron averted avoided those kinds of uh both people were yeah. culpable in nor efron movies is what i'm saying oh like when harry met sally and you know brian you and i did this one for the podcast mm -hmm. like it's still fucking good because yeah. like she doesn't let either of them get away with shit like right. The one time they really fucking hash it out um, when they're helping Jess and Marie move in, it is like both of them are just like, I would love to see a, a like gay Nora Ephron done really well. But yeah, the thing about Nora Ephron is she was a really, she was really fucking good with like, again like letting her characters talk and like letting them breathe and letting them like be stupid and own it and i just feel like billy just he tried and sometimes he succeeded and other times it was like oh sweetie like yeah it's all i mean it's also um and i would i would argue probably that dora efron would also consider this person an influence even though um he's sort of toxic now but like there's a lot of Woody Allen in this as well um particularly in the way he treats people um I rewatched uh Annie Hall about eight or nine years ago and I remember it's like I it's a movie that I like long loved and would claim as my favorite um but I watched it again um like I said just under a decade ago and I that was what struck me about it was like he treats her like garbage he's so mean to her and the end they end up breaking up so and it's an a, almost a more realistic ending in that way but throughout the movie it's a common recurrence yeah i mean and the thing about trying to be woody allen now like not that i loved a lot of his movies i took a whole fucking class on woody allen like what was it like 13 years ago um it's that whole like misanthropic sort of like yeah, and it's just, it hasn't necessarily held up super well. So if you're trying to modernize, like, a Woody Allen-like type of romantic comedy, which has a lot of good elements, but you have to be really careful about that misanthropic character, because, like, a lot of times, because I 
I feel like I've seen other writers and other filmmakers like try to do that. And it's like, y'all, like a lot of this is not cute anymore. It never really was, but like, it's. I mean, I'm not saying he like set out to make like a Woody Allen no. movie. I'm just saying that like, oh, no, like but- I mean, all that stuff is in the DNA of. I mean, there's like, you know, that New York, that neurotic, like, New Yorker, you know, like, there's Seinfeld and Larry David and, you know. Oh, um, right. It's just like, yeah, the misanthrope is just really hard to write well. And I have tried and failed. So there are moments, I feel like, where Billy succeeds. Like, like we talked about, he has a few good lines and a few moments where you're like, that's really funny. What a brilliant sort of insight. But yeah. And then other times you're just like, why are you yelling at me about this? It's also, like, it worked on difficult people because, like, you were supposed to think they were assholes. It's, and it's like, right there in the name. <laughs> difficult people was Drag Race on Logo, once again, to, like, bring back my comparison, where, where Rose is Drag Race on yeah. VH1 or now on TV. Like, it's difficult people, like, was for us. So I didn't mind that they were like making jokes at our expense. I loved it. And it gave us Cola Scola, or at least that's where I found them. Shakina and Apac, who was the trans waitress who was- Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't didn't know their name. I met them at the uh, O'Neill Center when I did a fellowship. They were across from me at the salad bar. (laughs) And like the smooth person I am, I went, you were on difficult people. Oh my God. And they were like, (laughs) Oh yeah, I'm still getting residual checks. Thanks for noticing. And I was like, <laughs> I love what? it. I love you. Nice. But anyways, um, no, one... uh, you're exactly right. I really, I love this analogy you have you have brought to the table. Um, I also wanted to mention that another thing both of these movies have in common is there's a climactic scene where someone sings to the romantic partner. And that's another in both cases where I'm just kind of like, I actually like the like the Britney one more, even though I don't like Britney mm-hmm. that much. Yes. Um, so I will cute. say, literally, because I thought it would piss people off, I was half hoping that they would nominate Billy Eichner's song for, for an Oscar just because. Oh, it's so bad, though. I know, but I mean, all those songs are always bad. Like, it's so, 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 so bad. I just want to. Wanted... It's bad even by Oscar song standards. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I just. I, he would love it, and I want that for him. That's all. That's true. I mean, if it had been a slightly better song, I would love that journey for him. But it yeah. just, oh, it was yeah. not. It was not because it's not like he's going to get nominated for best actor. You know, like right. That's another think, thing that no, the, he's not. Uh, I was thinking what? about it. I was thinking <laughs> no, he's about not. It. Speaking of Billy Eichner's acting, I was thinking about that. I was like, would this have worked if like? It had been someone else. Yeah. I was going to bring that up as well. Like, that's the other thing. And and we should talk briefly about the fact that he publicly sort of blamed people for not seeing his movie. Um, like, he was tweeting about it and he was all upset. Um, as if we had done this to him on purpose. Which was really, really off-putting, honestly. But I still love him. It's a yeah, very- that- Billy Eichner thing to do yeah. yeah I mean I I feel like he started started that and invited it when he like told us all that we had you know at the VMA awards which I don't watch but saw the clip but like we had to go see the movie bros to like stick it to Clarence Thomas like make a movie that we just want to see right make a movie that we want to see and so much of the movie is stuff that we want to see but it wasn't marketed to us even if they had two different ad campaigns like two different trailers like one for a straight audience one for a gay audience like that could have worked really well like show me show me what i want to see like show me what i'm interested in the movie for instead of this like oh there's gonna be i'm there'll there'll be a little gay bit of gay stuff in there to keep me happy like right yeah I, don't I, was, know. I was also going to say the party where he is like talking about how stupid everyone is. Um, I am very sad, a very different kind of gay movie, but I am very sad. Spoiler alert, did not get more love um, because it also, you know, true story also has some, you know, romance cliches, including like how they meet, which is at that kind of party, but which is done, which is a much better scene where like you are 
rooting for the awkward guy who doesn't really want to be there who like then gets hit on by the hot guy who everybody loves um but yeah that was an example of like I was thinking about that I'm like how would I have felt if Michael Osiello was like talking about how stupid everyone was and it's like yeah I probably would have been like no dude um you don't deserve hot what's his name um but it was just yeah and you know again like cliche meet cute but it's like you're embracing this and it works it works well rather than what Billy was trying to do with that party scene, which I know where he was going with that, but yeah, you're right. It's just was really off putting. Again, give that to like, I, if I know that's intended for me, like here for it, but I'm going to get protective, like right in front of when all the streets are in theoretically there too. Um, what was that scene with the testosterone it like i don't yeah. know if there was other stuff that was like edited out but like it literally went nowhere it like was weird. it was like only the only purpose it served was to like remind the audience that like you've got to do shit like that to have a body that looks like that but then it was just kind of like okay shrug whatever Again, it was the kind of thing that Fire Island did better because they actually had a conversation about like, I don't have ripped abs and, you know, that affects my self-esteem and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, like we're fully like fleshing this out, like something that I know a lot of, you know, my queer male friends have expressed and I know is just a thing with people and their bodies too but yeah it's just with bros it was kind of like I do wonder if if like there was more about that and it was cut or if it was just kind of like Billy Eichner forgot it was in there (laughs) yeah it's just there's moments you know there's a lot I think to like about it but there's also a lot that, that doesn't really get right and that feels sort of like I said patronizing and condescending and I think that's no go ahead Oh, I was just going to say, like, it's like Rob said, like, we would watch a whole show about, like, the museum board. And it's just, those were parts I really liked, too, because it's like, I think that is something straight people don't think about is, like, you know, the LGBTQ community is not a monolith. And, like, there are issues within it. And, like, there's still understanding we have to have and conversations we should be having that sometimes manifests in the lesbian and the bisexual yelling at each other. (laughs) Um, And it's just, yeah, it's like some things did hit, but overall got lost in just the like, you know, trying to, trying to appeal to absolutely everybody and just like trying to do too much. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, I know they made a big thing about how it was the first, you know, major studio comedy uh, financed and released by a major studio featuring two gay actors um, and gay lead roles. And it's really just it seems like they would have been better off without all that pressure. And if they mm-hmm. had just uh-huh. set out to write the movie first and then sell it, like, don't yeah. decide this is how we're going to we're going to write a comedy with two gays two gay men as leads and work backwards from there like write the script first and give it something i also like was like i guess like if we're defining it like adult romantic comedy and getting like really narrow but like and you know and if we really focus on the fact that it was like two gay actors which I don't think that they really did whenever they made that claim. Um, But I'm glad you brought that up because it does give it some credence and like distinguishes it from like Love, Simon was released four or five years ago. And that was a studio backed movie. The lead was not. There was a a straight guy playing the the, the gay lead, but um, I mean, it was a romance. It was a comedy. Yeah, it was about high schoolers. But like, I don't know. I, I 
I got defensive and protective of that movie because like it's one that I enjoy and felt like it didn't get you know credit for that moment yeah there was also later uh fun fact uh controversy with the author of uh the original book where someone where another queer author on twitter went after her and was like straight people shouldn't write queer characters and then she was like well actually i'm not straight here's my partner um realized while I was writing Simon that I wasn't straight and um yeah and she is very beloved in the in the queer community or in the like lit community and you know it kind of sucked because it's like she shouldn't have to she doesn't have to prove it like she wrote this beautiful like I have not read the original book but she wrote this book that became a movie that people adored and it's like you know, she was just trying to live her life. And yeah, I felt really bad about that. Um, sorry to get off topic, but yeah, like Love Simon was absolutely huge. Like that yeah. was one of our one of our first episodes was Love Simon and, and Weekend. Um, I have not finished Love Victor though. Um, I, the, oh. I have the last season debuted and I just never started it. It's cute. I mean, I I feel like that show is like very heavy handed at times. I definitely yeah. like the movie better, but yeah. they all cute. I'll watch them make out. It's great. <laughs> that's one that like, that's one that like, I'm like, this is not for me and that's okay. And I'm just glad it's, I'm glad it's there for, yeah. for everyone who yeah. needs it and everyone who just wants to enjoy it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think Brian, you and I have talked about this too. Like, that's what I like about there being more queer media is like, you know, it's not like the indie films of the nineties, although I miss those um, <laughs> where it's like, Oh my God, it's gay. Like we got to watch it. And now it's like, Oh, like we have choices, like not as many as we should have, but we have them. And, you know, that's why like a lot of times bad queer movies don't, I mean, depending, some of them piss me off a lot if they're super problematic, but sometimes it's just kind of like, oh, I like that we can say, like, a queer movie is not our thing or it's not good. Like, and although, yeah, I think I think an opportunity was kind of squandered here with, like, having a big budget queer movie, which, you know, Love, Simon, like, was a queer movie that like was in a lot of theaters and like was very beloved and then we have bros and it's just like oh <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say that i i there there's a line in there that really makes me think of you um of me yeah <laughs> do i dare ask of course aaron likes friends oh yeah <laughs> the i know the part I know. With the office gif like made me yes. that was another oh. like hit for me. It was just like I don't know. It's like you sure you're gay? Like he's not gay. This is an office gif, or it's Michael Scott. And I was like, oh my god, I loved it. Give me more of that. Give me more, Give of, me that. more of that. Yeah. And yes, the Evan Hansen line. I think I was like hooting in the theater <laughs> and probably getting some looks. But yeah, it's just like. The stuff that worked worked. It's just I wish more of it worked for me. Yeah, maybe if it was just simpler and the story of like this guy who's really ingrained in the gay community and this guy who watches Friends and sends Michael Scott gifts. Maybe that's all they need. This extra layer of like all of the exasperation and frustrations like with the gay community on top of loving the gay community. And right. don't get me wrong. A lot of those exasperations and critiques are 100% Absolutely. valid and are worth exploring. But maybe it was just one extra level too much right. because then it's almost like it's almost like they're bonding over like this just like yeah this not fitting into the gay community but like in different ways and it's um like that it's more of like if you want to have both those layers, like that's more like a series. If you're going to have that, than like a two hour plus movie, like that's a lot to ask of a two hour plus mainstream movie. 
Yeah. Because I feel like, because there are more like queer rom-com books now, again, not as many as there should be, but I feel like that trope, like of someone who's very embedded in the community and someone who is like more into friends at the office, I feel like I have read that book and Mm -hmm. it is, it's a very enjoyable, again, like it's opposites attract and there's an extra layer where it's, you know, place in the queer community or lack thereof but but yeah it's just then again yeah I think it was just it was he's trying to do the most I don't buy for a second that Billy Eichner is not a fan of friends he has seen every episode and there's no doubt in my mind (laughs) you have to say that if you ever meet him be like you watch every episode of friends He'd probably be like, of course I did. Why are you yelling at me? Yeah, no, I'm probably not going to do that. I would like to see a Fire Island sequel. Um, but I, this was another thing I wanted to circle back before we end the recording. I would love a Fire Island sequel, but I don't want any of those couples to still be together because that would not be a realistic depiction of gay men. Oh, I'd be, I would actually love to see like an exploration of Noah and Will's like, open relationship by coastal like like a check-in on how that's working like maybe it does maybe they do break up eventually but like maybe in the third movie but like in the second one i i th- i just like the second I one they would it would be another trip somewhere i feel like and they would all be coming maybe, together i'm thinking maybe destination wedding for charlie oh and there you go mm, okay okay and we see where Noah and Will are and it might be at like a more uncertain place. Um, oh, they've probably just opened their relationship. They just have, now there's a third and they're struggling with that. I'm into that. Um, yeah. I mean, I did really appreciate that about Fire Island too, yeah. that like it acknowledged non-monogamy in a very positive way. And like, just I think that's something pop culture still struggles with. I don't fucking need non-monogamy explained to me because but I just I just it was just enough where like it was it was acknowledged and it was like, oh, we're probably gonna explore this. And I was like, great. Um it it wasn't it wasn't a big scene. It was right. it, it was just a moment and that was great. Yeah. Yeah. I adore that. Now, if there were a sequel and they have a thruple and are like dealing with being a new, newly formed thruple, you know what? I would go on that journey with them <laughs> because I I find them delightful. But yeah. I, I definitely think like in a sequel, like we would be seeing like how Ian and Charlie like getting married and then, you know, just everyone else is doing what they do and shenanigans would ensue and I would absolutely watch it and enjoy every minute. <laughs> I'm sure uh, they're already working on it. I feel like I read at some point that there was plans or ideas for it, but I don't think anything was greenlit, Aww. but um, I will I donate to the GoFundMe. <laughs> no shit, me too. Put my name in the credits. <laughs> Um, would it be your name? I, would you want Joel Kim Booster to to know you participated? That's fine. That's fine. He Formerly known it. as on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Joel Kim Booster would be like, that bitch. <laughs> We're we, we'll we'll just we'll just say that that was a little misunderstanding due to a hundred and KB character restraints and leave it at that. <laughs> Fair. <Perfect>. Um <laughs> Also, um, I think I mentioned this before we started recording or before the episode started, but uh, these are both movies featuring Bo and Yang, so that's fun. Yes. Um, probably is only two movies, so we just got them, got them out of the way right at once. I will say that w- another line in bros I absolutely loved was, um, I have to go to a party and you're both too old to get in the pool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually had to, I actually covered like a gay pool party for uh, Go Magazine and it was in South Beach in Miami. And I had only seen like bros was not out yet and wouldn't be out for a few months, but that was in the trailer. And I think I even may have texted it to Rob. I'm like, I'm too old to get in the pool. 
I have yes. been at pool parties, not in Fire Island, but in Los Angeles, where I felt like I was too old to be in the pool. But that I was a, not in the pool was, anyway. That was another one where I felt like the the specificity of that, just like the yeah. queerness of that. It was like, this is good, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 like i said there's moments that really work and there's moments that don't and it's unfortunate they're that they're all in the same movie um does anybody have anything more they want to say about either of these 2022 queer rom-coms i feel very well represented excellent well thank you so much for coming on uh it's been awesome as it always is um lauren where can we find you on social media you can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Lauren Emily writes. Um, I'm on Twitter, not nearly as frequently anymore as Lauren Emily Rye, W R I, but you should follow me because uh, we are currently uh, going back and forth about the cover of my next book tomorrow and tomorrow, which is a very sexy and very, uh, queer adjacent i would say but there's a hell of a lot of queer representation reimagining of macbeth uh told through the eyes of an all-female rock band excellent that sounds fantastic rob what about you i am paths will cross p-a-t-h-s will cross um on letterboxd and instagram Fantastic. And I am so Brian Rowe. That's Brian with an I, R O W E, at Instagram and Letterboxd. I am no longer on Twitter. Uh, you can find the podcast at Piece of Pie Pod on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, give us a like, give us a follow. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss our next episode. Uh, the Oscars are coming up, which is always a fun one for us. Got a lot more planned coming down the pike. So make sure you're uh, subscribed. And until next time.